Man, lift your Bibles, how let's do it. This is my Bible. It is the word of God. My mind is committed, and my spirit is prepared to receive the word, which will give you faith and faith in God. I'm not just a hearer of the word, I'm a doer of the word. This word has given me life and life more abundantly. Shout it. I am in my promised land. Oh, y'all sound like an army tonight. High five your neighbor said, you've been set up. You've been set up. Yeah, hallelujah. Flip to John 13, if you would. John chapter 13 tonight. John 13. Uh, we are in and concluding the Passover day. And so I want to teach you tonight and encourage you tonight. I want to inform you and then inspire you. John 13, you got it? Now, you're going to be standing for a little bit. We're going to read a lot. John, that's all right. You've been sitting down all day on that phone. You need to stand and move your blood in your body. John 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Uh, I, I want you to look there at verse 1. He says, he knew his hour had come. Look at your neighbor and say, do you know the hour you're in? I find that most Christians, the problem is, is why they get so messed up in life is because they don't count. They have no understanding of the hour or the time that they're in. So they're trying to hold on to things that were prepared for yesterday and today and wonder why they grow stale. Verse 2, and supper being ended. And the devil already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid, hands or laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. Now, I want you to just see a couple things there, because we're not going to come back to John 13 too much tonight. He says, and supper being ended, and the devil already in the heart of his betrayer. Some of you need to understand that, that the, the people that flip on you and go crazy on you, they, they've been set up to do that the whole time. Don't, don't you be surprised by it. Don't you? Don't you? Sometimes we get caught off guard by stuff like that. No, the devil was already up in them. But look at what Jesus says. Jesus says, I already know I got all things. And I know where I come from and I know where I'm going. So I ain't even studying you, Judas. I feel bounce back part two maybe coming up tonight. I don't know. <laughs> Verse five, after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. Now, that's something because he says, I know you're going to betray me, you sucker, you snake, you conniving scoundrel. But I wash your feet anyhow because I know where I'm going. You, my friend, on the other hand, do not. Okay, verse 6, then he said to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, uh, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will understand after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. But Jesus answered, if I do not wash, you will have no part with me. So Simon said, Lord, not my feet only, but get my hands and my head. Pe Peter, you got to thank people that know they got issues. You know what I'm saying? A lot of folk fake that they ain't got nothing. I love the people that say, get my hands, my feet, touch it. But look what Jesus said to him. He was bathed, only need to wash his feet, and it's completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. <laughs> he, he said, let me y'all cool. It's one of y'all that ain't clean. Watch this. And me washing his feet ain't going to make him clean. Ooh, Jesus, I'm going to preach to myself. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you all, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, then you should wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor he who is sent greater than he who is sent. And if you do these things, blessed are you if you do them. If I do not speak concerning all of you, I love it because he continues to remind them that there's some good promises for some folk, but he said, but I ain't talking to all of y'all. 
See, even tonight, while I'm in the house tonight and those watching everywhere, there, there's some good stuff I got to tell you tonight about what's getting ready to take place in your life, but, but it ain't for all y'all. It ain't, it ain't for all y'all. Uh, look at your neighbor. Say, is it for you? Is it for you? Uh, uh, Look what he says. I know whom I have chosen, but that scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whoever my sin uh, receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Look at 21. When Jesus said these things, he was troubled in his spirit and said, Most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now, there was one leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of the, his disciples whom Jesus loved. That was John. Simon Peter therefore mentioned to him, uh, ask who it was of, of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast or his chest, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered and said, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after, the piece, uh, now, after the piece of the bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do it quickly. I, I just want to take a 30-second break tonight. You ain't got time to be sitting up worrying about nobody, crying about nobody, crying about no situation, worried about who ain't this and that. No, you need to look at your enemy and say, whatever you got to do, play or do it quickly. Whatever you finish, yeah, I, I wish somebody, whatever you got to do, just do it quickly because I got a life to live. Life goes on. You look at your financial trouble and tell them, whatever you got to do, hurry up and get done. I ain't got time to be fooling with you all day. You got to call the bank that's trying to take that. Listen, I ain't got time for this all day. Whatever you're going to do, do it quickly because life's got to go on. <laughs> but nobody knew what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box that Jesus said that to him. By those things we needed for the feast so that we should give something to the poor. He, he thought, he, the, the disciples thought when Jesus said, do what you must do quickly, he was telling Judas, man, get down to the shop. Get down to the Jerusalem market before they close at 6. Because see, Passover, they would have taken the meal in the eve. And so get down there and get that matzah before they close. Are you still here? But now look at this, verse 30. Having received the priest of bread, he went out immediately, and it was night. Look at verse 31, a couple more. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him when? Immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little longer. You will seek me, as I, as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. And I say to you now, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this you will know, uh, they will know, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus said, you can't come, but you'll follow me afterward. Peter said, why can't I come now? He said, I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus says, will you lay down your life for my sake? He says, Peter, stop all of the rhetoric. Because most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster won't even crow till you've denied me three times. Father, we thank you for the word tonight we're getting ready to dive into. It is like a pool full of spiritual richness that we are about to dive into. And as we dive in it tonight, I pray that you would speak to everybody wherever they're at under the sound of my voice to the specificity of their situation. Only you know what they're dealing with, what they're feeling, what they're going through. Only you know all of those details. And so tonight, do what only you can do, which is take a human vessel and speak so clearly through that human vessel that when they leave this place, they cannot deny that they have had an encounter with the Lord God Almighty. And we thank you that it is so in Jesus' name. Somebody shout hallelujah. High five two or three people as you take your seats and say the benefits of Passover, the benefits of Passover. Hallelujah. You can be seated tonight. I want to go through this. I want to give you some background. Then I want to get us to where we are in John 13. John 13 is referred to as the Lord's uh, or the Last Supper. It is actually the feast 
the Passover that Jesus is receiving uh, with his disciples. Say Passover. Now, there are seven major biblical feasts or festivals. I've taught on these before. You can get those resources in the resource centers. I'm not going to spend too much time here tonight. Uh, in the Hebrew calendar, there are four different starts to that calendar, depending on the purpose and, and uh, depending on the spe specificity for the reason. But there are four different starts. Now, that's important to notice because many times when people read their Bible, they will read it uh, through a Gregorian calendar. Gregorian calendar is a January through December calendar, but the Bible's not written that way. It's written according to God's timetable. Say God's timetable. Now, that's important to understand God's timetable is not our timetable. Matter of fact, if you begin to look at your life, you will begin to see that each year at certain times in your life, you will face similar circumstances. You will face similar uh, adversities because you are on God's timetable. God has a cycle and a process that he utilizes to bring out the best in you. And many times he repeats that cycle repeatedly just at a different level and at a different intensity. I wish somebody was in the house tonight. So if you look over your life, you'll see that in certain months, if you look back for years, that you're always facing a certain kind of opposition or a certain kind of spirit. Or am I talking to anybody tonight or am I just talking to the microphone? And so when you look back over your life, you will see that there has been a cycle of feast or a cycle of holy convocations working in your life. I'm going to take you through that in just a moment. Now, all feasts, say all feasts point to Christ as the Messiah as a way for Jews to believe and fulfill all things prophesied. Now, I'm going to tell you what the feasts are in a moment, but you need to first understand that these feasts are not to do anything except to point to Jesus the Christ. Jesus is the answer. It's always been about him. It's always been about his purpose being fulfilled in the earth. And so when we look at these seven feasts, we will see Christ in all of them. Now, this is important because some of you are saying, Bishop, what does this have to do? I thought you just said that I'd see certain cycles and different things in my life. Well, what you need to understand is, is whatever situation you're facing, in the middle of it, it's about Jesus. Well, whatever you're dealing with, in the middle, it's about Jesus saying, I got to be glorified out of this. And you may have to hurt for a little while. You may have to go through some stuff for a little while. But by the end of this, I'm in the middle, and it's pointing to me. How five somebody says it's pointing to Jesus? It's pointing to Jesus. Now, Leviticus 23, 4, you can write it down. I'm going to go uh, real quick. It says this. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed time. So whenever I say the word feast, I'm really saying appointed time. Say that with me. Now, the awesome thing is about an appointed time is that these seven feasts, these were not a man trying to reach God. These feasts were God stretching out to reach man. See, it's one thing when earth initiates a conversation with heaven. It's a whole nother thing when heaven initiates a conversation with earth. I'm here to tell you, in this season of the Passover, God says, I'm initiating a conversation with you. And that's why some of the turmoil and some of the issues you've been going through have been the way they've been. Because God says, hey, I'm trying to talk to you. I wish somebody was in the house and so... A feast means an appointed time. It is literally an appointment with God where God's office calls your life and makes it. Now, here's the thing about it. Your life secretary sometimes doesn't let you know about the appointment. And so sometimes you'll find yourself right in the middle of the doctor's office and not even know that you're there. You're still with me. Now, the concept, now, we, we, Leviticus 23, 4, it says, these are feasts of the Lord, holy convocations. Holy convocation means it is a holy purpose or a holy meeting between God and man. Say meeting between God and me. Now, watch this. The concept was that if you missed your appointed time or the feast or the holy convocation, that you missed God's appointment with you for that season of your life. Which means if I miss him talking now, I got to wait until this cycle repeats itself this time next year. That's why some of you have felt like in your life you've been on the merry-go-round because God says every time I show up for my meeting, you're not there. And you sit on the doctor's table complaining, why are you doing this and why are you doing that? And God says, baby, I'm trying to talk to you. And if you miss your meeting with me, you got to wait till next year. But I think there's some people in the house tonight that say, I'm not waiting another year. I'm not waiting another another day. I'm not waiting another moment. I want my meeting now. Now watch this. Watch this. 
God is not limited to these seasons or these feasts or these holy convocations. He's not limited to that, but this is historically throughout his own Bible. This is how he's operated with his people. Now, the feasts are based on the Hebrew lunar calendar. You're going to have to get to night CD because you're not going to remember all this. It deals with agricultural seasons. In, in essence, it deals with seasons of sowing, seasons of reaping. Seasons of sowing, seasons of reaping. That's agriculture. Now, since the feasts are fulfilled in Christ, the Messiah, anyone who is in Christ is presented with the opportunity to meet with God in a supernatural way. I need you to get that. Because as we're looking at these tonight, I do not want you to think that this is just some good stuff, the Bible lesson in history. Oh, no, if you are in Christ, then you are entitled to these meetings. Now, now, that's good news because there's some meetings that you can't get in on. But this is a meeting where God says, if you're in me, you can get in on this meeting. And if you're in this service tonight and you're not in Christ, by the time you leave tonight, you're going to be in Christ so you can get in on the meeting. Amen. Now, the blessings of the feast no longer apply just to Jews, but now to anyone who is in Christ Jesus. Genesis 22, 15 through 18. This is the Lord speaking to Abram and he says, he says, a blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies and your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. Doesn't Genesis 22 sound a lot like Genesis 12 where he says, Abraham, now I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. I will make your name great, and in you all the families of the earth shall be what? Bless. Y'all got it tonight. Y'all be in a real good class. I can get through this right quick. So now what that means is this. Uh, uh, the promise to Abraham, which is the covenant we partake in, we as believers in Jesus Christ are partakers in the Genesis 12 covenant. Bishop, what's that covenant? It's real simple. God makes an agreement with you. He says, I'm going to bless you. And then he says, I'm going to bless everybody to do right by you. And he says, now, Abraham, I know you're going to have some haters. And I know you're going to have some folk that's going to do you wrong. So I'm going to make you a promise in my covenant about that. I'm going to curse them that curse you. And he says, and you, I will make all the families great. Now, uh, Genesis 22, God adds something to the covenant because he says, your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Now, that's interesting because we see the term gate used somewhere else in Scripture with a very similar meaning where Jesus says, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So I began to think if he says the uh, descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies, maybe that means we have to be close enough to the the fire in order to grab it okay your neighbor that went right over their head uh, we cannot be afraid beloved to get in a fight sometimes we we cannot be afraid to sometimes have to fight for what we believe and fight until we see it manifest because the Lord says I'm gonna possess the gate of my enemies which means I'm gonna walk right up to their door and say now listen you gonna give me what's mine or I'm gonna take it by force that's why kingdom people say we don't come to take sides we come to take now watch this. There are seven major feasts. Now remember, feast is also holy convocation. It just means an appointed meeting with God. Who sets it up? God does. Now that's awesome. To think that the God that formed the universe would think enough about us to set up a meeting. <laughs> Your neighbor didn't get that. <laughs> Your neighbor didn't get that. To think that the God that put Pluto way out there, and the God that put all them rings around Saturn, and the God that made it so that Earth was the only planet in this particular galaxy that's inhabitable by, by human beings, and the God that then would make a human being and call that human being his son, and call that human being his image, and call that human being his likeness, and tell that human being, now you have dominion over everything you can see. To think that that God would take time to schedule meetings is amazing to me. You, you're missing the simplicity of it. He didn't have Gabriel set it up. He didn't have Michael set it up. He didn't have the cherubim set it up. God himself said, Leviticus 23, 4, now these are the times I want to meet with you. Show up ready to do work. Now, there are how many of them? 
seven that are major, that are important. Now, the number seven means, it means entering into God's rest. Entering into God's rest. Now, as believers in Christ, I, I know there are a lot of folk that, that think, well, you know, you're supposed to have well, one day as the Sabbath. Mm -mm. They, they need to read Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. As believers in Jesus Christ, for us, every day is the rest of God. Which means if I have a day where I get stressed out, that means I got outside of the will of God. You're not hearing me. Because what that means is, is I've stepped out of him and stepped into me. See, Sabbath just means a day of rest. It means a holy day. It means a day set apart for him. Now, as a believer in Jesus Christ, every day for us is Sabbath. Every day is a holy day set aside for him. So in these feasts, we see seven. We see seven several times throughout the Bible, but it just simply means entering into God's rest. Now, let me be clear with you because sometimes we say that, and then what believers think is, well, that means there's not going to be any more fighting. No, that's not what it means. Now, let me be clear, Denver, about what I mean about fighting. I'm not talking about going outside in the parking lot and doing stuff. You've got to come to the altar for the prayer partners to pray off of you. I'm talking about... <laughs> Because I know some of y'all, you got stuff on your purse and, and your wallet now. that you <laughs> You saying, Lord, please don't let me fall out in church tonight because I. Now watch this. <laughs> now, now watch this. The, the fight means this. It, is that as believers, and you know, I don't understand. Can, can I tell y'all something about me? It's Wednesday night. I can tell y'all stuff, right? Guess not. Okay, so I, I don't understand people that that lack intestinal fortitude. I cleaned it up real nice. I, because, you know, especially believers, you know, the children of Israel, God says the land is yours, land is yours, take it, just go take it. And we're like grasshoppers in our own sight. Yeah, how are we supposed to do that? Go out there and take the land. Go, go do what I, go do, go, just go take it, it's yours. There are giants in that land. I mean, whatever. Those are big guys, Lord. Lord, I, I, I know your word says I can be healed, but my God, that's such a long process. I know your word says I'm the head and not the tail, but can I just be the in-between right now? I mean, it's a lot of work. <laughs> I know your word says that, I, that, I, that I'm always overcoming and never being overcome, but can I just this one time go under because I just... And why you might not say it verbally, you say it subconsciously through your actions. Let me say, what do you mean? Uh, uh, God says, just take it, it's yours. But they didn't want to have to go out and possess it. Matter of fact, Numbers uses a very specific word. It says repossess. Now, now if you've ever had, just look straight ahead so you don't tell on yourself. If you've ever had a repossession, you know most times they don't come up to your door and ask for your keys. Come on, it's all right. We, we all join the club. We're all wearing the T-shirt. If you've ever had a repossession, you know, normally, they like the Lord, they come like a thief in the night. <laughs> they don't even need your key. They want you key. That's why when you go buy a used car and only got one key, they'll tell you what the story is on the car. Okay, y'all, that's too much for you. Okay. Y'all just thought it got lost. <laughs> no. <laughs> they got that one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, here's, here's what that means. It, entering into God, God's rest does not mean it's, there's not issues we're going to have to deal with. Entering into God's rest means I'm fully prepared to deal with the issue. Look at the neighbor and say, you're fully prepared. You may not feel like it. You may not think it. You may not believe it. You may be saying to yourself, I can't take no more. Lord Jesus, help me, Lord Jesus. You know, you remember Big Mama, she used to call on Jesus for everything. God, help me, Lord Jesus, these cheering. And Jesus looks back at you and says, you got it. I'm living on the inside of you. You can handle this. You can overcome this. So entering into God's rest doesn't mean there's not some stuff we're going to go through. It just means that we're fully prepared to deal with it. You got that? Okay, now let's look at these seven feasts. Now, uh, uh, we, we just this past Sunday, we had, of course, Palm Sunday. This isn't one of the feasts. I just want to kind of get you in, in the proper fit here. Palm Sunday, you can look at Luke 19, 28 through 34, 44. Palm Sunday says that 
the Messiah would be one who could bridle a colt, that person would be Messiah. And as he walked into the city, they used palms to cover his path, uh, which gave him the highest honor. Whenever they put palms out for someone to walk on or someone to move upon, it was the highest honor they could give in that culture. Now, Jesus rode into the city. He rode into the city, the scripture teaches us, among several different animals it calls it, it calls it the donkey. Got it? Now, now understand in that culture, a donkey was a like having an expensive automobile. A donkey wasn't a, you know, little, little thing. You know, a donkey was like you're driving a Rolls Royce, like the Phantom. <laughs> so Jesus enters to the, into the city on a Phantom. Well, y'all remember coming to America, how they threw them roses for King Jaffa Jafar? That's how Jesus went into the city. He, well, they, they got out there. Cut, they, now, Mr. Why is it important to understand that? Because some people want to make your Jesus something he's not. They want to make our Jesus some, some weak, uh, passive, uh, uh, walking around, hugging trees, a uh, no, weirdo. No, your Jesus was, was, my God, your Jesus was the most awesomest of awesome that you could ever encounter. Your Jesus walked around knowing stuff about people and choosing to keep his mouth closed and said, listen, you better not start that with me. I got five rocks. I ain't throwing one at you yet, boy. You better shut your mouth. See, Jesus, your Jesus had power, but he knew how to bridle that power. And sometimes you got to walk around full name. <laughs> I got power now. Don't make me use what I got. So now it's important to understand it. Now, when we look at these, at these seven feasts, let's get into that now. There were three feasts that were in the fall. I'm going to give these to you real quick. Again, I've taught on these before. I encourage you to get the uh, teachings and DVDs and CDs and all that. Three fall feasts. <coughs> the Feast of Trumpets is the first one. It's also called Rosh Hashanah. It's literally the new biblical year. It's the new biblical year. Second is called Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. The third is the Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Tabernacles. In your Bible, it's also referred to as the Feast of Booths, Feast of Ingathering. Our old name, the Feast of the Final Harvest, uh, the Feast of Sukkot. Uh, essentially, Tabernacles, this meant it was the Lord dwelling with us. The Lord dwelling with us. So Rosh Hashanah starts the year. Day of Atonement gets the year right at the beginning of it so that you don't walk into a new year with all this baggage and tabernacles was God saying now that you got your stuff together I can come dwell with you I'm gonna give it to you again so you get the three fall feasts uh, the new year begins God says now don't bring all that foolishness from last year in here so they had the day of atonement which in that time they would repent they would get things right with God etc then after they got things right with God God says now I can come and dwell or tabernacle with you you got that? Now, again, I've told on those before. You can get more information. Now, I want to get to the spring feast because this is where we're at now. And I got six minutes to do it. Got it? Now, <coughs> in these, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give them to you in order, but I'm going to begin explaining them from reverse order so I can end on Passover where we are right now. All right? So now, the, the, the first of the spring feast is Passover. The Passover. It was literally the crucifixion of Christ. Now, please understand, uh, Christ was not crucified on Friday. And folks, well, are you going to Good Friday service? Them people are crazy. Now, he's just saying that. That's why, Harvey, we don't, Bishop, you got a Good Friday service? It, Friday, every Friday good. <laughs> Jesus was not crucified on Friday. He was crucified at the twilight on Passover. Now, you say, well, Bishop, well, but you know, I just was raised believing Jesus could be said on Friday. Well, just let's do some basic math. Okay, because I don't understand saints that can't count. The Bible says he was, he was in the belly of the earth three days, three nights. Friday night. Saturday night. S Sunday morning? Now, I don't care how you add, where you from, what country you from, whether you went to DPS or Cherry Creek schools or rural schools, I don't care where you went. Ain't no way Friday to Sunday equal three. I'm just telling you, people, oh, no, it's a holy day, Friday. You got to be, Jesus died. He was dead by that point. All right. 
I just need you to understand that. Now, after the Passover was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, leaven in Scripture meant evil or error. So unleavened bread would meant what? Let, let, let's go ahead and just get country for a little bit. Unevil bread. <laughs> Errorless bread. <laughs> All right? Now, now, now th this is important because Jesus' body, if you understand this in Scripture, Jesus' body did not decay uh, as he was uh, dead as a human being. His body did not decay. He was unleavened bread. Leaven and bread, you would think of as adding yeast, and that kind of bread will eventually mold. Got it? So if you look at it from baking terms, now I can't even cook, and I know that. Now, if you look at it from baking terms, uh, you, you understand unleavened bread, and we'll come more back to that in just a moment. As, after unleavened bread is the Feast of First Fruits. This is actually Easter Sunday is the Feast of First Fruits. Christ's resurrection. And the fourth is the Feast of Weeks, W-E-E-K-S, the Feast of Weeks. In your Bible, it's also called the Feast of Shavuot. It's also called the Feast of Our Name, the Feast of the Harvest. And it's also called the Day of Pentecost. Got it? Okay, now, now I told you I was going to give them to you in that order. Now, I, 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 I want to explain this to you. Now, can I go to Passover? And then we'll walk from there so you understand how this whole thing plays out. Now, remember, these are what? Appointed times for God to meet with us, where he sets these meetings up. Okay, I need you to get that, because if you don't understand that, then you will just see these as some holidays that we celebrate as some religious pagan thing that we do. No, 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 no. These are special times that God has set aside. Now, you got this? Now, now watch this. Passover originates from when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt and the death angel was coming. And as the death angel was coming, the Bible said to apply the blood of the lamb at your doorpost and the death angel would pass over. In essence, what was killing the people next to you will not be able to get even get in your house. See, when we look at the feast of the Passover, the first benefit of it is that no death can come nigh my dwelling place. That that. Th th that means I know the doctor may have given me a report, but that report directly contradicts the report of the Lord because I understand the benefits of the Passover, which tells me that what may have killed somebody else is not going to kill me. What may have stressed somebody else out is not going to stress me out. Man, some of the stuff you've been through and you've made it, do you know people have taken their lives because of that stuff? Do you know people have quit on God because of that stuff? But baby, you're still here and you're still standing. Why? Because the blood was applied over your life. And when Jesus said, it is finished, he said, no death can come nigh that dwelling. You didn't even know you were close to death. And the blood stepped in it. You didn't even know that plane was supposed to crash, but the blood, no death can come nigh that dwelling. And if you remember the movie Ten Commandments, you heard wails and cries throughout the city. But where the Hebrews were, there was none of that noise. Matter of fact, they were coming together and they felt sorry for the people that didn't have what they had. So God says, in this time of Passover, it's a time to be thankful because there are some people that are wailing and crying around you. You ain't got it that bad. You may be going through some stuff in your life, but baby, it's not over. God gets the last word. That's the first benefit. Now, now second benefit to the Passover is... It's a time when God gets the leaven out of your life. Now, Bishop, what does that mean? Uh, let, let me, now, look at what happened with Jesus. Pre preceding the Passover, wh wh what happened? He was betrayed. Watch this. Betrayal precedes promotion. Okay, you, you, you can't hear. Let me say it again. Betrayal precedes promotion. Now, now I, I need you to understand that because if you've ever been in a situation in life where, where there has been betrayal, then, then, then sometimes you wonder, God, when, what is the reason for what's What in the world? Because uh, sometimes you're trying to figure out, God, I didn't sow this. So why am I reaping this? Okay, y'all are going to go be real tonight. Have you ever sat up in a situation in life and been like, I didn't sow this. 
So, you know, I was loyal and I was this and I was caring and I was loving. I didn't sow this, so how in heaven am I reaping this? I got to be nicer from last Wednesday. Amen. Now, now, now watch this. <laughs> watch this. It's a time when God says, the stuff in your life that was causing your life to mold, leaven, I get it out. Judas was mold, and he needed to go because he wasn't part of the plan. See, I, I know there's some folk in your life that you say, well, what is it? They needed to go because they weren't part of the plan. They were moldy and crusty and stale and stank. Stank is a southern colloquialism, which simply means they were out of fragrance for the current aroma in your life. Say, Levin, I, I lose you. Now, third, th that's the second benefit. Second benefit. That's the second benefit. To get that leaven out. Now, now, that leaven also means I have to change certain things in my life. I, I can't look at Judas and then go back and invite the same kind of Judas back. So it's a time for me to learn from Judas and say, okay, now, oh, okay, okay. Oh, I wasn't looking out for that. Oh, I didn't. Oh. I see you. Because do you understand spirits don't, don't die, they just simply jump into different bodies? I need to say that again. Spirits don't die, they jump into different bodies. And so maybe, maybe you're facing a certain spiritual battle and you're trying to, well, what the, all they did was change bodies. Okay. I, I don't have time. I, I, I won't do it. I don't have time to teach that. Third benefit of the Passover. Now remember, we're starting with the Passover. We're going to get all the way to Shavuot. And that's when we shout. Hallelujah. Because during Passover is when it can look darkest. Pa Passover, I'm mean, the third benefit. Passover uh, is when God sets you up for an unexpected bounce back. Now, I'm going to say that again. Passover is when God sets you up for an unexpected uh, bounce back because during Passover, things look real grim. It looked real grim. When the savior of the world is now being beaten and he's now being treated as a prisoner. When the man that laid hands on people and healed them and those same people that he healed are now cuffing him. And the same people that he healed are now yelling blasphemy at him. And the same people that he healed are now cursing him and saying all kind of wretched things about him. It looks pretty grim. But you have to love Jesus because Jesus said, I knew you were coming. And he said, as a matter of fact, Judas, check this out. I asked you to follow me. You, you didn't think I had such. Okay, I can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't teach that the way I want to. I, I, I can't teach it the way I want to. Third benefit of the Passover is an unexpected bounce back. The disciples didn't know what to do for those three days because they're saying, man, we just had Passover. This is a meeting with God. If it's a meeting with God, why didn't things get better? If this is a holy convocation, a feast of the Lord, why are things seeming to get worse during this time? Why is all this foolishness going on and folk ain't doing this and this ain't right and this ain't right? But because God says, I set you up for an unexpected bounce back. Now, the fourth benefit, I got to move. The fourth benefit, the fourth benefit is how he sets you up for it. For those of you taking notes and you're very... Uh, procedural in how you take your notes. Uh, the, 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 the fourth benefit is the designated offering with a promised return. God, well, hear, hear me and hear me well, Harvest. God never, ever talks to you about seed unless he has a harvest on his mind. And, and some of you say, well, Bishop, but uh, well, are you talking about money only? Oh, no. Oh, no. So you got to get to take forced investments because, see, there's some stuff that you thought you lost. And God says, I made you invest it and sow it as seed. Uh, you got to get tape. I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. Now, you say, Bishop, where does it say that? Deuteronomy 16, 16 through 17. Flip there real quick. Deuteronomy 16, 16 through 17. Am I helping anybody tonight? All right. Deuteronomy 16, 16 through 17. 
You got it? If you don't look on the screen. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place he chooses. Say that's here. At the Feast of Unleavened Bread. <clears throat> The Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Tabernacles. Listen to what he says. And they shall not appear. You read it. Every man shall. Come on, read it. Verse 17. Come on. Every man shall. Now watch this. God, why would God, if it's a holy convocation, and the holy meaning, because remember, after Passover is what? Unleavened bread. Immediately proceeding. Why would he talk about an offering. Things look grim. The Passover just happened. No, your neighbor's not getting it. Why would he talk to me about sowing when I don't have as much as I like to sow? Please get it tonight. Why would he talk to me about an offering when when he need to talk to me? Wait till I get my check from the because I just filed it on Monday. Why would he talk to me about an offering when things look grim? Because the Passover just happened. God always speaks to you at your weakest point about doing something you don't realize or don't think you have the strength to do. At your weakest point, he'll say, forgive your enemy. At your weakest point, he'll say, sow your seed. At your weakest point, he speaks to you because he says, it's the season of the Passover, and I've got an unexpected bounce back on my mind so that by the time you sow this seed, by the time first fruits get here, it's time for you to get a harvest. I wish you were. Okay, I see I got to teach it a little more because you didn't get it. I got to teach it a little bit more. Say unexpected bounce back. Now, now watch this. After Passover, immediately proceeding is the what? Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, now we, we talked about that because following Passover, for seven days, they could only eat unleavened bread. Literally, the Jews would have to get all the leaven out of their house. They'd go through their house. They'd get rid of all their cinnamon rolls, all their cookies, all their cakes. Thank God I'm not a Jew. I struggle with this feast every year. I'd be asking for forgiveness while I mean the twinkle. Just thank you, Jesus, for me. <laughs> I'm joking. I don't even like Twinkies. Now, say unleavened bread. Now, remember, he says, three times a year, all your males shall appear before me. He just means heads of household. Shall appear before me, and they shall not come out empty-handed. But each one shall give according as the Lord has blessed him. Now, now, after it looks so dark, why would he talk to me about an offering? Have you ever noticed God does that? You're like, this ain't even my pay cycle. <laughs> Why would he talk to me about that? Come on, can, can we be real tonight? Yeah. Be like, Lord, I had plans for that. And here you come on a Wednesday night. I was hoping Bishop was going to do bounce back part two. And now you talking about Passover. <laughs> talking about an offering. Now, see. See, the, the devil wants to mess with your mind now because, see, it, it, it doesn't make sense when he asks you what he asks you to do. He will ask you after you lost everything to give more. He will ask you after you've gone through the greatest hurt in your life to love more. He always asks you for things that you don't think you have the ability to give. Am I talking to anybody? I know I'm not the only one. Y'all please raise your hand and move your knee or blink your eye. Do something so I know I'm not alone. We go from Passover, I'm about through, to unleavened bread. He says, now, it looks dark, but now don't come before me empty-handed. Wh wh why? Because I got a promise that if, if I sow during this time, th that the next feast has to come. Okay, let me, let me give it to you. I said I got to teach you a little more so you get it. Th the next feast preceding unleavened bread is what? First fruits. First fruits is actually, as the world calls it Easter Sunday, we call it Resurrection Sunday. It is actually Christ's resurrection. H here's what first fruit means, I even when we talk about the first fruit principle, even in your giving. It's a guarantee that the rest of the crop is secure. See, that's why Jesus is not the only begotten son of God. That's not true. No, the Bible says he's made you to be sons. 
He was the first fruit of the sons of God. And since he's holy, come on, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. If the first fruit is holy, that means I am too. If the first fruit is righteous, that means I am too. If the first fruit doesn't lack for anything, that means I don't either. Now look at this. Look at this. It was Christ's resurrection on that Sunday. It was a guarantee that the rest of the crop would be harvested. It's a guarantee that the rest of the crop was secure. Are y'all with me? Now you say, Bishop, what does all this do? Because then it sets you up for the final spring feast. And the final spring feast is called the Feast of or Shavuot or Harvest. Thank you for coming to church tonight. I see y'all ain't with me, so. Y'all come on and sing the song so the saints can. He says, I ask you to trust me in your darkest moment with something you don't think you can do or think you can give. Or think you can give another shot at because you've been let down so many times. He says, I ask you in that moment to not come before me empty handed. Why? Because he says, there's a first fruit that rises that guarantees the next feast. The next feast is called the Feast of the Harvest. I can see I might have to reteach that again because we're not getting it. We're not getting it. What did I tell you earlier? God never speaks to you about a seed unless he has a harvest on. Okay, you're still not getting it. So God says, every year, I'm going to set it up so that when it looks darkest in your life, but you choose to trust me, not just money, whatever it is he's asking you to trust him with, but you choose to trust me. I'm going to make sure that Jesus is going to get up this year, just like he did last year, just like he did 2,000 years ago. And since he got up, that's a promise that the feast of the harvest is coming, which means whatever I sowed when my life looked real bad, I've got a guaranteed harvest. Now, some of you are saying, well, Bishop, what are you talking about? You talking about money? I, listen, you read the Bible. What I'm saying to you is, in your darkest moments, that's when he asks you to trust him with something that you don't even think you got the ability to give. And for you, maybe, maybe money's not the deal. For you, maybe it's releasing somebody that did something to you. And you want to hold on to that because it's your safety blanket. It's your way to make sure it doesn't happen to you again. But what you fail to understand is by holding on to it, you perpetuate it and make sure it happens to you again. Because even when a that shows up, you make it a this. Got to get last Wednesday's tape. This is what are you saying? In this moment... God says, I set a meeting with you, and I got some benefits of this time that you're in in your life. It may look like whatever it looks like, but you need to understand I've already made you some promises. And if you'll trust me during the Passover and during the unleavened bread, I promise you he's going to get up on Sunday morning. See, maybe you don't understand the significance of him getting up. Him getting up was not just about you getting a get-out-of-hell-free card. Him getting up was a guarantee that whatever I sow, I'm guaranteed a harvest. Because if the first fruit is there, the rest of the harvest is guaranteed. Y'all getting it? Now, Father, tonight, whatever it is you're asking for in this moment, during this time of the Passover, whatever it is, tonight we make a conscious decision Whatever you've been speaking to us, maybe whatever it is, you know what it is. Everybody under my voice knows what I'm talking about because you've been talking to them about it. Whatever it is, I pray now that in this moment, they'd have a clear understanding of that. And they wouldn't be afraid to step out 
and trust you. In the moment when it looks dark, but we know Sunday's coming. And since Sunday's always going to come, we got a guarantee that the harvest has got to come. We thank you for the Passover, which just says that there's some stuff that can't happen to us. The saints used to say you protect us from danger, seen and unseen. You've been doing that forever. Because the death angels kept away from our house. There, there were some things that were supposed to make us go crazy, but he couldn't even come into the house because the blood was there. And so we bless you for that. We honor you for that in the name of Jesus. Everybody stand on your feet tonight. Did, did we get this tonight? Did we get this word? All right. How many people you said, Bishop, I didn't quite get it. I didn't quite get it. Okay, good. I, not that I'd expect you to raise your hand. <laughs> but I want to make sure you get it. You got to get some of the additional teachings about this tonight. In a Wednesday setting, I only have a limited amount of time. But, but I, I need you to understand this. This is a meeting God has set up with us. And in God setting up this meeting, God says, I'm trying to speak to you some things. Even in this moment now, God says, there's some of you have been trying to figure out, Lord, which direction? How do I do this? How do I do this? How, how do I do all that? And God says, listen, I'm, I'm the meeting set. Meeting set. All you got to do is show up and let me talk. And let me do what I got to do. So we bless you for that, Father. We thank you for the benefits of the Passover. We thank you for that. We thank you that you've set us up for an unexpected bounce back. I said we thank you you set us up for an unexpected bounce back. You set us up for an unexpected bounce back. Oh, my God. It's unexpected. We, we weren't even expected for the blessing to be that big. We, we weren't even expecting for it to be that awesome. But it is. And we thank you for it. Tonight, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, I don't want to assume anybody here knows the Lord tonight. If you're here tonight, you don't know Jesus. All of these blessings and these benefits and all of this that I'm talking about tonight, that's reserved for believers. And if you're not a believer tonight, with your head bound, your eyes closed, I just want you on the count of three, slip your hand up because we want to give you an opportunity to become one. And number two, if you need to get things right with God, what a better time to get it right with God. Don't, don't leave here as an enemy of God. Don't leave here. The song used to say, not on the Lord's side. Leave on the Lord's side tonight. And if that's you, wherever you are, we don't care what you've done. We don't care about your past. We care about your future. If that's you tonight, slip your hand up. One, two, three. If that's you tonight, slip your hand up wherever you are. Bless you. Bless you. The ushers are coming. Come on, Harvest. Y'all can bless God for that. Come on, Harvest. Y'all can bless God for that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to lift your hands all over, all over the internet, everywhere. I want you to say this. Say, Lord, in this season of the Passover, I thank you that while things in certain areas may not look the way I want them to, you have set me up for an unexpected bounce back. You have set me up for a great harvest. And I thank you that your word will not return to me void. Thank you for these seven feasts, the meetings you've set with us. We're opening our ears to hear you. We're listening to you, Father. Speak clearly. We will hear, and we shall obey. In Jesus' name, everywhere I look, I see good things happening. I realize no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rises in judgment, I condemn. I thank you that the rest of my days, my God in heaven shall be the best of my days. I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged. Yeah. I dare some encouraged folk to just act like it. Shout, I'm encouraged. In Jesus' name. Uh, why don't you hug two, three, two or three people as you take your seats and say, we've got to get that CD. got to get that CD. 
Let's see what's going on at Harvest this week. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to today's life-giving message. Harvest exists to change lives by leading people to totally love God, love people, and love life as one church in global locations. And if you have a testimony of how Harvest has changed your life, let us know on our website contact us page. We're able to continue to change lives because of the faithful giving of people just like you. And if you'd like to contribute to Harvest financially, you can do so today online at www.harvestcc.me. Remember to love God, love people and love life.